this is recording now. So up to you. Over to you. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Okay. So uh, thanks uh, for inviting me. And uh, um, if you have questions or comments, please interrupt me whenever you want. Uh, I would appreciate also to make this talk a bit more lively, I would say. And uh, if there are some questions in the chat, I would ask some organizers to read them for me whenever they want, because I, I don't think I'm able to read the chat. Okay, so the, um, the title of my talk is uh, Toric Geometry and Singularities on K-Moduli. And uh, this is based uh, on uh, two uh, collaborations, one with Alessio Cordi and Paul Hakim, and another one with uh, Anne-Sophie, uh, who is organizing uh, this uh, workshop. Um, so the, the idea of this talk is that uh, using toric geometry, so somehow explicit uh, combinatorial things like uh, polyhedra, you can create uh, k-polystable fun varieties which are obstructed. So they have uh, obstructed deformations and this gives uh, singular points uh, on the k moduli stack and the k moduli spaces, as I will try to explain. Uh, so, I, I always work over C, but everything works basically of every field of a characteristic zero. And for me, a fun variety, maybe I should here write uh, more precisely that is a Q fun variety. So, this is a normal projective variety such that the anti canonical Q Cartier and Ample, and I always consider only log terminal singularities. Uh, now, if you fix n a positive integer and v a positive rational number, you can create the moduli functor of k semi-stable fun varieties of dimension n and volume v. So this is a functor from the category, contravariant functor from the category of schemes to the category of groupoids. And uh, uh, when you take t an arbitrary scheme, uh, you consider basically families which are flat, proper, uh, okay, finite type. And then the fibers are K semi-stable Fano of dimension N and volume V. And also there is a technical condition here, which is called, uh, sometimes it's called Collar's condition. Some other times it's called the Q-Gorenstein condition. And I will always abbreviate, abbreviate it in this way, QG. And uh, this is a technical condition, which is important in every moduli problem. So it was invented for KSB moduli. And uh, the idea is that the, basically the canonical divisors of the fibers fit to well to well in the family. And, uh, but I will not talk about this condition. To, um, so, okay. And uh, one of the imp important result that was proved uh, in the last uh, two years, I would say, uh, has been proved by several combinations of uh, these people here. And um, the, the theorem is that this uh, functor that I just defined before is actually an Artin stack of finite type over C. And not only this is an Artin stack, but uh, somehow all the automorphisms of objects there are, I mean, all, all the close points, there are reductive. And uh, so it emits uh, a good moduli space. And this good moduli space is denoting in this way. And here, the, before there was a calligraphic M, and now there is a straight M. And uh, the subsc subscript is uh, KPS because actually the closed point of this algebraic space is uh, corresponds to the set of K polystable Fano handfuls with volume P. Uh, okay, so basically the situation is that uh, I have uh, the stack which is the calligraphic M is, is an Artin stack, and then there is a structure map to uh, a straight M, which is a uh, mm, algebraic space. And uh, the, there has been this situation has been studied in some examples. For instance, uh, and this case was done by Odaka, Spot, and Soon for basically the pezzo surfaces, so dimension two, and the smooth case, so smooth the pezzo surfaces or smooth about those pezzo surfaces. And this uh, uh, theorem, actually, this example is uh, mm, comes before the, the it, it happened. You know, it was done before the, the theorem that I, I just stated above. And then the, the case of cubic trifolds was studied by Liu and Xu, and then cubic fourfolds by Liu, where basically they proved that uh, 
k stability is the same as GIT stability. So you take the linear system of three faults and then you quotient out the automorphism group of the ambient space. And then recently the, there has been work done by Asher de Fleming Liu who studied basically k moduli of pairs where uh, they consider here surfaces or uh, certain surfaces so for instance, P2 or the degenerations or P1 cos P1 or K3 surfaces together with some divisor. And then they change the coefficients of the divisor. But uh, my point is that in all these examples, which are quite explicit, uh, the moduli space, so the algebraic space uh, uh, that parameterize K polystable fan varieties are normal. And uh, 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 I want to explain this result, uh, which is done by um, me and uh, Anne Sophie. And uh, we prove that uh, in any dimension, at least three, it is possible to find uh, a degree V, uh, uh, rational V, such that uh, the stack of the corresponding uh, dimension and degree and, the, and the, the space of the corresponding dimension and degree is either reducible or not reduced. And uh, in order to do that, basically we have to consider uh, Fano, which are singular and obstructed. Okay, in, in order to do that, I need to say something about deformation theory, especially more precisely Q Gorenstein deformation theory, uh, because this gives uh, the local structure of the stack and the, the K moduli space. So here in this slide, I just want to recall some. Uh, well-known facts about the deformation theory. And this applies uh, to every variety, not only uh, fun variety. So here I fix X, a normal Q Gardenstein variety. And then I, I, what is a QG deformation? A Q Gardenstein deformation of X, this is just uh, uh, a Cartesian square. So you fix T an arbitrary scheme, let's say maybe of finite type, or I don't know, let's say an arbitrary Unitarian scheme. And then uh, the formation of X is just a Cartesian diagram uh, where of this type where here I have a morphism from curly X to T and I require that this morphism is uh, satisfied the same properties of the moduli. So this is a flat uh, of finite type and this is the Q Gorenstein. And so basically, this is, as this is flat and satisfies scholar's condition, this is a, has to be thought of as a continuous family of variety. And one of the five is my variety X. And uh, there is a way to study all the deformations of your variety, which is uh, formalized in the following way. Uh, you consider basically the category of complete local Netherian C algebras with residue field C. And uh, all these rings are something like this. So they, have, they are local rings, which are quotient of a power series ring modulus a certain ideal. And then we take, uh, uh, we consider these as germs at the origin. So germs of analytic spaces, let's say. And then uh, out of that, you can create a, a deformation functor, which I denote in this way, def x. So this is a, um, the, basically the restriction of the moduli functor to these germs. And uh, uh, for every T, uh, which is a, a germ or equivalently a complete local Netherian algebra satisfying this hypothesis, then you can associate it, uh, the set of Q Gorenstein deformations of X over T up to isomorphism. And uh, this is a well study object in deformation theory. And um, classical deformation theory tells you that this functor is represented by a certain ring that I would denote in this way, hull, because it's called the hull, but uh, this notation actually is not uh, standard. So I just invented it for this talk. And here I am cheating a lot. Uh, so the people that know this stuff should forgive me. And the people that know, don't know the, the technical issues, I think it's fine the way I presented. So here I cheat, I'm cheating a bit, but... Uh, so there is basically, when you have X a normal q and variety, you can associate uh, a, a local ring, which determines a germ, which is uh, the base. So the spec of Hull is the base of the universal deformation of X. 
and uh, since uh, I'm cheating, actually this is not a, a, a universal deformation, but this is called the universal deformation. People with some uh, analytic, uh, more analytic nature call this uh, deformation the Kuranishi deformation or Kuranishi family. Of X, and this is uh, the so somehow this universal deformation. Every other deformation comes from this one, and um, and this is quite uh, interesting to compute this. Uh, what is this the base of the universal deformation? So what is the hull? What is this ring? Given uh, an arbitrary variety, and uh, the, here I'm just state, stating some theorems. Uh, uh, which sorry, are... could, could I ask about what you mean by universal? So. I would have said there might be a versal deformation, maybe not universal, but then I don't know what mini versal means. Uh, okay, so you're right, it's the versal one, but then if you require that the, on the, um, so there are many versal deformations mm -hmm. because they are come, I mean, if you have a versal deformation, then you take a product with the smooth factors, this is again versal. So that somehow the, the versa deformation with the smallest tangent space is universal. It's called universal. Okay, thanks. And uh, and so here, if you write uh, the hull as the power series ring modulo a certain ideal, then you call e the embedded dimension of this ring. So this somehow is the number of variables. Then this embedded dimension can be computed in terms of x. And uh, this is just the dimension of this vector space. So if X is a smooth variety is a, or a Gorenstein variety here, X can is literally X. If X is not Gorenstein, X can is actually the index one cover. And then uh, if you want to understand what are the generators of J, and uh, the number of them is bounded above by another dimension, which can be computed in terms of X. So this is a very classical theory. And uh, in particular, it says that if this vector space, so this X2 omega O is zero, then J must be zero. And so somehow the hull uh, is just a, a power series ring modulo the zero ideal. So this is a power series ring. And so this means that it defines the smooth J. And this is quite um, important uh, uh, condition to have. Uh, so this condition uh, ensures you that uh, your variety is unobstructed. Okay, so now let's go back to uh, uh, stability somehow. So now let's fix X, a K polystable fun of variety of dimension N and degree V. And this gives a closed point uh, of the stack and then uh, also a point on the K moduli space. And I will denote this point by uh, bracket X. And if you apply the um, Luna slice et al theorem of, of Alper, Hall, and Reed to this situation, basically you get the local structure uh, at the point X. So the local structure is given by this uh, Cartesian diagram, where here I have my uh, art in stack, here I have the algebraic space. Uh, which is the good model space. This is the structure map. And then I consider the hull, uh, which I did define in the previous slide. This hull uh, has a natural action of the automorphism group. And so I can take the quotient stack. Maybe I should write something like this. So I have my affine, uh, I mean, this is not a variety because it's a local ring. So this is a, let's say germ, a my affine germ modulo a reductive group. Maybe I should say that. So out of X is reductive. And so here I have my quotient stack and then the course, the good model space of this quotient stack is just the spectrum of the invariant part. And also, uh, the, this diagram is Cartesian and not only, but the horizontal maps are et al. So somehow this says that uh, this ring, which is a local ring, is exactly the completion should be thought as the stock 
of this space at the point x. Uh, and in particular, if my if my hull x is smooth, uh, which happens, for instance, if that x to omega o is zero, so x is uh, unobstructed, then definitely we have that the stack upstairs is smooth because uh, now this stack now is smooth because the hull is smooth. And downstairs, I have that I have a smooth guy uh, under the action of a reductive group. And so it is, uh, so it's very easy to prove that, uh, so this means that uh, the local ring is normal. And also it is a theorem due to Hoxter, I think, uh, uh, that uh, for instance is Coe Macaulay. And also there is another theorem that tells you that it has rational singularities. So if you want to construct the singularities uh, worse than normal or worse than coin macaulay you have to pick some some variety x such that the hull of x is not smooth so somehow x is obstructed and this is basically what i did with Ansofit that we created those explicit varieties with toy geometry so here i just want to state uh, uh, some results about uh, unobstructedness of funo varieties so if x is funo and here, uh, stability is not involved anymore. So because uh, uh, the stability is involved only in the existence of the global uh, stack, but if you want to consider the deformation functor, you don't care about stability and you can take any variety. So if I take X a funnel variety, so if X is smooth, then the hull of X is, uh, is smooth. Um, and the, the reason for that is very easy because basically the x2 omega x of x, this is h2 of the tangent, but then uh, h2 of the tangent is uh, zero because the tangent is uh, equal to omega x and minus one omega x dual. And now uh, this guy here is ample. And so we apply Kodaira Nakano function. Uh, and this theorem actually works also for small dimension and mild singularities. So for instance, in dimension two, uh, also this is true also for every surface. And uh, this, is, this is true for three folds with terminal singularities. This is the uh, work done by uh, Namikawa in the Coverstein case and Sano in general. So basically, you know, if we want to take uh, an obstructed Fano, we have to consider dimension three and singularity, at least dimension three and singularity is worse than terminal. Okay, so now I, uh, I, I need to introduce a bit of toric geometry. And um, so I want to talk about toric funnel varieties. So uh, here I have uh, N, a lattice of rank N. Uh, so this is just uh, a way to say that I pick uh, Zn and I don't choose a basis. And then I consider Fano polytop, and this is just a polytop in the corresponding real vector space. So this is n tensor r, this is rn. And the Fano polytop is just a polytop which is full dimension. So the dimension of p is equal to n. Uh, the origin lies in the interior of p. And every vertex of P is a primitive element of the, of the lattice. So there are no lattice points between the origin and the vertices. So uh, before considering this example, I want to make an easier example, uh, which is uh, you take n equal to Z2. And then, so this is the plane, the usual lattice. So let's say that this is the origin. And then I consider this triangle here. And this triangle is, of course, a Fano polytope because the, it has a dimension two, the origin is in the middle, and then every vertex is primitive uh, lattice uh, vector. And this other example is, uh, has n z equal to three. And uh, this polytope P here, this is the origin, zero, zero, zero. And then basically it is a hexagonal prism so it has a, a top face, which is, um, and also bottom face is the same. It, it is a hexagon like this. Uh, 
So you should imagine that this hexagon here leaves uh, on the horizontal plane z equal one, and the horizontal uh, this hexagon here leaves on the plane z equal minus one, and then uh, there are uh, six uh, vertical facets. Uh, which are given in this way. So these are the rectangles of this type. Uh, is this example clear? Um, any comments about this example? Because it will appear again. I find it very clear. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between Fano polytops and toric Fano varieties, uh, which is uh, given as follows. You, you start from a Fano polytop P in a lattice, and then you consider the phase fan of P. So this is the collection of the cones over the faces of P. And then you can consider XP, the toric variety associated to sigma P. And XP is Fano, so minus K is Q, Cartier, and Dampol, and it has uh, log terminal singularities. So for instance, in the example of the triang triangle that I drew before, I drawn before, here you have uh, this triangle here. And now if I pick, for instance, this vertex, this is a zero dimension face. And then I should take the cone over that. And the cone over that uh, is a ray. So it's a one dimensional cone. The same happens to the other vertices. And now if I consider uh, this one dimensional face, then I take the cone over that and I consider basically this cone. And this happens also for the other edges. And uh, now basically we have a fan, which is given by three uh, two dimensional cones, three one dimensional cones, and also one zero dimensional cones. And this variety is uh, P2P. Uh, notice that uh, here, I think it is a crucial point. My polytope P is not the moment polytope of the polarization of XP. So somehow this P lives in the same lattice of the fan of XP. Whereas if you have a polarization, so like a moment polytope, that polytope lives on the character lattice of the torus. So uh, that polytope lives in the dual lattice. Here, I'm only considering polytopes which live in the co-character lattice. So they live in the same uh, lattice of the fan. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, from this construction, uh, since XP is fan, then you can take the anti-canonical polarization and then you can consider the, do, the associated polytope in the usual, let's say, moment polytope sense. And that polytope is not my P and it actually is the polar of P. So it lives in the dual lattice. And uh, it is a criterion, which I think it was uh, done uh, initially by Donaldson and Behrman using some differential geometry. And then it was, I think, translated in a, using in algebraic geometry, using only algebraic geometry method by many, many people. And I'm, I apologize for, uh, for, many, for the many people that I'm not citing now. But somehow it is easy to, uh, to say when the, the variety is capably stable. And you have to consider the polytope P, you take the polar of that, and then the barycentric is zero. But in, in this talk, I will never uh, draw the polar of P. Because also, basically, all my polyps I will take care uh, are satisfying this assumption. OK. Now, if you have a P, a Fano polytope, then uh, uh, you consider the toric affine variety XP. And of course, there is, a, as for toric varieties, there is a, a canonical uh, um, affine cover, which is the collection of the affine charts. Uh, so basically here uh, I have a UF are the toric affine variety associated to the cone over F. 
Uh, and so basically the F is a facet of P and this gives uh, a cone and then it gives uh, an affine chart. In the previous slide here, I have, uh, I pick the facets of P. So these are these three edges and this defines the usual uh, standard affine cover of P2. Okay, and uh, the problem here is uh, try to understand uh, the formations and smoothings of my toric affine variety XP. And in other words is uh, what kind of combinatorial gadgets uh, you want to put on P in order to get the formations and smoothings. And this is a very interesting problem for many, many perspectives, not only the, uh, uh, I mean, not, not only case stability somehow, because uh, the, the first uh, motivation could be that we want to extend somehow the toric dictionary between uh, the algebra geometry of toric varieties and then the discrete geometry of polytops. Another reason for doing that is it has uh, this kind of ideas uh, has uh, roots in uh, mirror symmetry uh, for fun varieties, I would say. And also this is a quite, uh, could be a powerful uh, tool in order to, to construct many fun varieties in higher dimension, for instance. So you pick a, a polytope that maybe you, you know how to construct it from, uh, with the computer, for instance, then uh, you apply uh, a technology that tells you, okay, this singular toric variety smooths to a smooth fan variety. And this problem has two sub-problems. Uh, the first problem is uh, understand the deformations of the affine charts. So this is a local problem. And the, the second sub-problem is uh, glue the deformations of the affine charts in order to get the deformation of the global projective uh, variety. So this is uh, a local to global problem. And uh, in this talk, I will not talk about the second sub-problem. I, I will concentrate on the first, uh, uh, the, the first sub-problem. So I, I will concentrate on deformations of affine toric varieties. And uh, I will not say anything about the second problem, which exists actually. Okay, so in order to, uh, to study the formations of a fine toric variety, I need to say something which is only combinatorial. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, there is something else before I want to say. Uh, I, I here I just mentioned a result due to Bien and Brion in a specific case and then generalized by Totaro, which tells the following. If you have a toric fan variety, which is smooth in dimension two and Q factorial in dimension three, then this variety is rigid. So somehow the germ of the universal deformation is just a point. So you have to pick, uh, if you want an, an obstructed thing, you have to pick a variety which is uh, fairly singular somehow. Okay, so this is uh, the combinatorial intermezzo. <laughs> Uh, and uh, here I'm not talking about, I, I'm not saying anything about the geometry geometry. So this is a, just a construction in polyhedral geometry, discrete geometry. So fix F a facet of your polytope P, and then we uh, associated to that, we have an affine chart uh, to, of the uh, projective fan variety. And uh, what is the Minkowski decomposition of F? The Minkowski decomposition of F is just an equality of this type where F is equal to the sum of Fj's where Fj's are lattice polytopes. And here I have to clarify what I mean by this sum. So this sum here is Minkowski sum. So here I just write the definition if I have A and B two subsets of Rn, their Minkowski sum, which is denoted in this way, is just the set of the sums. So this is the Minkowski sum. And now I want to make uh, two examples, an example of a Minkowski sum. So for instance, if I take this triangle here, and then I want to sum it with uh, this other triangle. So what you have to do is, uh, everything here is up to translation. So we could say that uh, this triangle here is um, uh, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. 
And then in order to understand what is the sum, you have to pick an arbitrary point in the first triangle and you have to attach there the second triangle. So here I have my uh, first triangle, then I pick an arbitrary point, let's say this one, and then I have to attach the second triangle, like this. Now I pick another point, for instance, this vertex here, and I attach the second triangle. And then I have to understand what happens if I move the first, the attaching point, moving in the first triangle and what kind of area I cover uh, with the second triangle by doing this. So for instance, if I take this point here, I attach the second triangle, I get this. If I pick a point here and I attach the second triangle, I get this triangle here. If I pick, for instance, I don't know, a point here, I attach the second triangle, I get this and so on. And then we try to understand what what area we cover by doing this. And then it is not difficult to imagine that we cover exactly this hexagon. So the Minkowski sum of, uh, of these two triangle is this hexagon. And this exactly was the top face or the bottom face of the prism that I was uh, describing at the beginning, I mean, some slides ago. Another, another example I want to make is do the Minkowski sum of these three segments. So Minkowski sum is uh, associative. So I can, for instance, take the Minkowski sum of the first two. So if I want to understand what is the Minkowski sum of the first two, I have to pick the first segment and then I have to attach to every point the second segment. So to this point, I attach the second segment. To this point, I attach the second segment and so on. So in this way, I basically I cover this square. And then I still have to attach the second set, uh, the third segment, the diagonal one. And now basically I have my square and then I have to attach the second, the, the, the diagonal segments. And I basically cover uh, exactly the same hexagon. So this is exactly the same hexagon. And uh, you could say uh, that basically this hexagon has two different Minkowski decomposition, actually three different Minkowski decomposition. I mean, more than three. Uh, but let's say maximal ones, because this is, I don't want this, because this is mass uh, decomposable. But if you want to consider what are the maximal Minkowski decompositions, here I have uh, either in two triangles or three segments. Any questions about this? Okay, so I assume not. Uh, so, and um, there is a theory that was uh, created by Klaus Altman, uh, who said the following. If you have a Minkowski decomposition of a polygon, let's po actually polytope in any dimension, F, uh, this gives, uh, so you have your F, you take the cone over F, and then this gives an affinitary variety, UF. And Klaus Altman says that if you have a Minkowski decomposition of this polytope F, then you get a deformation of UF. And so here the situation is the following. I have my hexagon, and then I have the, my two Minkowski decompositions. So uh, if, if you take uh, this, uh, mm, uh, this polygon and you put at height one, you create the vertex, the, the cone, then uh, the question is what, what kind of variety is this? And now I just want to give a non-toric description of this variety. So what is UF in this case? So F is this hexagon here. And what you do is you take the Del Pezzo surface of degree six. So this is the blow up of P2 in three points. And uh, the anti-canonical system is very ample and it embeds it in P6. So this is the surface inside P6. And now you take the affine cone over this embedding. So now basically UF is a threefold uh, with an isolated singularity. 
and this isolated singularity is just the vertex of the cone. And uh, using uh, Altman's theory that I'm not explaining because it, it has, uh, it, it's basically totally geometry, so it, uh, it is a lot of combinatorics. You, you starting from this uh, Minkowski decomposition, then you get a deformation of your F. And uh, starting from the other Minkowski decomposition, so the one with the, with the segments, you get another deformation. of UF. And uh, these deformations are both smoothings, so the singularity disappears, but they are topologically distant. So you, one can compute the Betty numbers of the minor fibers in these two uh, smoothings, and they are completely different. And uh, if uh, one uh, wants to understand what is the versal deformation, uh, the universal deformation of UF, uh, here I basically have uh, that the hull of UF is uh, C T S one S three. So the embedded dimension is three modulo T times S one T times S three. So basically here uh, the spectrum of this ring is just the union of a plane and a line. And the plane correspond to the decomposition of the with, uh, into three segments and the line correspond to the decomposition into the triangles. So basically there are two irreducible components in the versal deformations, in the versal deformation of this uh, singularity. Okay, any question? Uh, so I have uh, one simple question, sir. Yeah. I, you just here described another I um, mean, the decomposition uh, we have the square and the one line, and that decomposition do not produce any deformation. Of uh, it does, but uh, it produces a locus inside uh, the the red one. Uh -huh. Be somehow the, 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 the correspondences between maximal Minkowski decompositions, so the compositions okay. that are not uh, cannot be refined with the uh -huh. reducible components. I see, thank you. And uh, uh, I should say that, uh, so here the situation is a bit subtle. If you have a Minkowski decomposition, then you always have a deformation. But if you want to talk about the versal, the versal deformation and this one-to-one -one correspondence, this works only for isolated three full singularities. Uh -huh. So it's a bit. Uh... I see. Okay. Other questions. So this UF is affine, right? Sorry. So this UF is affine cone, right? Yeah. 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 So, how do you formulate the deformation theory? I mean, you regard it as a singularity. But, but yes, but this is an isolated singularity. So uh -huh. I see. Okay. Okay. I see, I see, yeah. And actually, I, okay, I don't know exactly, but I would, I think the, I mean, the, the existence of the Kuranishi family, the existence of the Versa deformation requires that uh, the T1 is finitely generated. And, uh, but I think uh, for a fine Tory variety, this should not be a big problem, also if it's not. Somehow, somehow the action of the torus should help you. Hmm. For uh, but uh, then things could get complicated because now you you are not taking a, a scheme, but maybe it is an end scheme, so it's a limit, uh, an inductive limit of I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, other questions before I go on. Okay, and uh, now I want to state the theorem. This works for in dimension three. And the situation is the following. You take P a Fano polytope. Uh, so uh, I will say in a minute what it means reflexive. So uh, P is a Fano polytope dimension three. 
and then we associate xp our toric funnel associated to the phase fun of p as before and i'm assuming that xp has Gorenstein singularities and uh, this assumption is equivalent to say that p is a reflexive polytope for the people that know what means, but uh, I, I don't want to go into this kind of details. And now uh, our theorem says, now uh, you pick every facet F of P and we choose a Minkowski decomposition of the facet. And we require that uh, this Minkowski decomposition, uh, the summons that appear uh, in the Minkowski decomposition are, are particular type. So we don't want to consider arbitrary summons, but we want to consider the, what we call A triangles. So A triangles are either you take a unit segment or you take a, 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 a triangle of this type. So not uh, uh, the standard triangle, let's say, or you take this one, or you take this one and so on up to of course, GL to Z. So we require that the summons are of this type. So it is either a segment or a lattice triangles such that there are no interior points and then two edges have length one. And uh, there is a reason for choosing this because these triangles give the compound dual singularities. Okay. Now, for every facet F, we choose a, a Minkowski decomposition into A triangles, and then we assume a technical condition uh, that is a bit complicated to explain. And this, uh, this technical condition is related to the local to global abstraction problem that I'm, I don't want to talk about. But uh, at a priori, it is quite important thing, but a posteriori, it rules out very, very, very few cases. So it is a, somehow for some reasons that we don't understand completely is a, a weak condition. And uh, out of this datum, so a polytope to get, together with the Minkowski decomposition of each facet, we construct the smoothing of XP. Uh, and the idea, as I said before, is just to try to glue the deformations of each affine charts. And uh, the way we glue them, of course, we cannot use uh, deformation theory on, on the nose because the singularities are isolated and the, the things are, get complicated. But the idea is that we, we go to a certain resolution of our Tori variety, and then there the singularities are isolated and we work there and then we go down again. And this is uh, similar for the people that uh, know the paper by Collar and Shepherd Barron to the business of P resolutions. So when you have a cyclic quotient singularities of dimension two, then there are different components that they correspond to the P resolution of the singularity. Okay. Uh, so this is a theorem and now uh, I want to make an example. Uh, the example is uh, uh, the hexagonal prism that I was describing before. So here, uh, this example was studied in detail by Anne-Sophie and me. Okay, so I have my, my hexagonal prism and now I have to apply this theorem. So I have to choose a Minkowski decomposition of each facet. So here there are the two uh, facets, which are the hexagons. And here, if we want to apply the theorem, uh, here we can choose either the decomposition into triangles or the decomposition into segments. And uh, you can choose whatever you want. And then there are six facets which are this rectangle here. And uh, the only decomposition of this rectangle satisfying the hypothesis of the theorem is this one. So basically you take uh, the decomposition into three segments. And there are no other decomposition that you can take uh, satisfying, I mean, this is the only maximal Minkowski decomposition. So this should say somehow that the singularity corresponding to this uh, chart is uh, unobstructed. So the base uh, is uh, um, the base of the Versa deformation is uh, is, um, is smooth, and this is true also because this is a hypersurface. 
So this singularity is uh, a hypersurface in four-dimensional affine space given by this equation. And so it is obvious that there is only one way to deform this singularity. So to sum up, uh, if I want to apply the theorem to this polytope, uh, for the six vertical facets, I don't have any choice. So I just have to pick uh, this Minkowski decomposition. For the top and bottom fa facet, I have, a cho I have two choices for each of them. And so this gives four the choices because I could choose uh, the decomposition into triangles on both bot top and bottom, the decomposition into segments on both uh, top and bottom, or the decomposition into uh, triangles above, segments below, or vice versa, conversely. So there are four choices. And uh, this should more or less say that this variety can be deformed in four ways. Notice that there is also another thing that uh, if you apply an automorphism of this polytope, which swap top and bottom, so this is the reflection um, with respect to the horizontal plane, then basically uh, the, the, the mixed uh, the, the choices, so the one that you choose both um, um, triangles and segments are swapped. So somehow, basically, uh, these two irreducible components should go, should give the same smoothing somehow up to an isomorphism of the central fiber. And this is exactly what we, uh, it happens in algebraic geometry. So this slide uh, here, I'm uh, uh, explaining uh, the algebraic geometry results of what I've just said in, in terms of the combinatorics of the polytope. So, you have P and a hexagonal prism as before. X is the time fan variety associated to the phase fan of P. X is k stable because uh, it is very easy to check this. And uh, it has uh, a threefold with Goldstein canonical singularities. And the anti canonical degree is 12. And then we computed the using uh, ordinary deformation theory the hull of X, so the base of the versal deformation. And this is a germ of uh, embedded dimension 24 and four equations. And here you can see that uh, 18 equation, uh, sorry, 18 coordinates uh, from T7 to 24, they don't appear in the equations. And these are the coordinates responsible for the deformations of the hypersurface singularities. And then the, the first six coordinates are grouped in the following way. So I have uh, the first three and the uh, four, five, six. And these are exactly the germs of the, sing the two singularities, the two isolated singularities corresponding to the hexagonal facets. So somehow this hull is a product of the germ of the uh, top singularity, the germ of the bottom singularity, and then a smooth germ coming from the hypersurface singularity. And this has four irreducible components. And uh, it is possible to compute the automorphism group the automorphism includes just the torus uh, extended uh, with the finite group. And then we computed the invariant uh, subring. And uh, it, it happens that the invariant subring has three irreducible components. So basically, the two irreducible components uh, coming from the mixed uh, choice are going to the same irreducible components downstairs. So uh, maybe I should say again that uh, this is uh, the local structure. Of, uh, of the stack, and this is the local structure of the space. And uh, in more explicitly, uh, we can say that basically X deforms to the following three smooth funnel trefolds as follows. So on the component uh, T1, T4 equals zero. So this is the component uh, where I chose uh, segments on both top and bottom. I get the deformation of X to these uh, trefolds. So rho here is the Picard rank. and the H12 is just the large number. So basically on this component, I deform to a, P, a, fan, a smooth Fano trefold of rank two, Picard rank two, and it is the sixth entry in the Mori Mukai list. On, the, on this component here, which corresponds to, uh, I think, triangles on both, and, uh, both top and bottom, I deform to a, a smooth Fano trefold of Picard rank three, 
And then on the mixed, uh, on the other two components, I deform to B12. So the, the smooth panel three folds of Picard rank one. Okay. And uh, yeah, so my, uh, my last example is this one. So um, this is a polytope, which is not reflexive. So the corresponding Tori Vano variety is not Gorenstein. And here, the, one can compute the anti-canonical degree and the hull of X is this fat point. And uh, the reason why this is true is the following. So basically here, let's consider the facets of this polytope. So there are, on, on the front, there are four triangles. These triangles don't, are very nice. And then on the back, there are also other four triangles. So let's forget them. And then there is the, bot, the top face and the bottom face. And this, uh, the bottom face and the top face is this polygon uh, right here that I've just uh, drawn. And uh, this is the affine cone over, you take F1, the first is the big surface and you embed inside P8. And, um, one can show that the versal deformation, so this is a isolated threefold singularity and the versal deformation of this singularity is the fat point of the dual numbers. So CT modulo T square. And here there are two of them. So the top and the bottom. And so the hull of X is just the product of this. Of course, you have to prove something in order to achieve that. And then one can compute the automorphism group and then the sub ring uh, of course, identifies these two points somehow. And uh, so uh, we get that uh, the, the, ring, the sub ring of invariance is just CT modulo T square. And this is the local structure of the K modulo space. And so uh, a consequence of this calculation is that uh, the spectrum of the, the dual numbers is a connected component of this algebraic space. So K polystable uh, Fano trifolds of uh, uh, Mm, volume uh, 44 over three. And um, yeah, this is uh, the end of my talk. And um, let me know if you have questions. So let's thank Andrea. And does anyone have questions? So for this last uh, hull calculation, so you use this Altman deformation? For this one, you mean? Yeah. Uh, how, how do you see it? Yes, so basically this uh, singularity, the versa, the versa deformation of this singularity has been studied by the Altman and he says that it is this guy here. And then basically we did the kind of local to global um, comparison because I mean, if you have a global variety, you can always restrict, and then there are some restriction maps between deformation functors, and mm -hmm. then you would like to understand what are tangent spaces, obstruction, these kind of things. Mm -hmm. Any other Thank question? But I thought... Uh... So as Taro San is here, yeah. okay. I, I, I don't I don't remember the detail. What he, he he pointed out to me some another example or is it the same or Taro are you are you here? No. Uh, well, yeah. I, yeah. I was studying with uh, yeah <laughs> with some other another guy, but uh, yeah, we didn't have a. Yeah, description of the current space. So yeah. <laughs> so there. What was the volume? What was the degree? Hmm? Sorry? What was the degree? Degree? Yeah. Actually the I think the example is all yeah, exactly the same one. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I I should say that this example here was studied also by Christopherson and Hil Hilton. Hilton, not Hilton. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. they computed the um, they did something slightly different because they they considered the Hilbert scheme 
of this variety. So this variety embeds inside the P, I don't remember exactly, uh, P, yes. um, how many points? Uh, six plus three, P nine, P8. P8. Yeah. So th this variety embeds in P8 anti-canonically, and I think they studied the, the yield scheme of this closed embedding. And with some computer calculations, they proved uh, that there are three irreducible components on the Hilbe scheme, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I see. So three among four are achieved in the. It's the three deformation uh, families of smooth Fano three forms that well, it deforms you... to. There are two different deformations that are to the same family. Uh -huh. So or you have- It could be that there are four reducible components in the Hilbert scheme. I don't remember exactly. I think it's three. Any more questions? Ah, so can, can I ask then, so yeah, what's, uh, so your theorem is uh, RSA and uh, Paul? <laughs> yes. Uh, so do, so you know that uh, there, there is some smoothing in some case, uh, but uh, do, you know, do you have some example, other example with uh, also explicit HAL? Yeah, description of the HAL. Yeah, yeah, is. Um... Well, no, no. No, with uh, maybe no no isolated singularities. Mm, I would say yes, ah. Ah, but right. uh, if the maybe, the problem is that you... if you have this, if you have uh, non isolated things, uh, uh, computing the app is a bit complicated, more complicated. Right. Right. For instance, uh, okay, this is not related to case stability, but if you take. Uh, uh, P1236. So this is the cone over P123 inside P6. So basically, P123 is a defect surface, uh, a singular defect surface with two singularities. It's a Gorenstein one of degree six. And so it embeds inside P6 anti canonically. Mm -hmm. And now you take the projective cone over this embedding. Yeah. Uh, am I saying bullshit? I hope not. And uh, this guy is exactly this weighted projective space. Mm -hmm. And again, basically this, the, the, same, the same problem of the path surface of degree six appears. And so this guy has two reducible components. Mm -hmm. So somehow, I didn't say that, but uh, it's related to what uh, Miles Reed calls Tom and Jerry. So if you have a Gorenstein, so if you have Gorenstein singularities, codimension one and two are hypersurfaces. Codimension three is they are Fafian after Buxbaum and Eisenbad. And codimension four, Gorenstein singularities, uh, the structure theorem tells us that somehow there could be, there are two ways to write the equations. And these two ways of the writing the equations tells you that there are two deformations more or less. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Uh, so in the final example, so why did you pay attention to this uh, non-Gorenstein part of Azir Enya? Uh, yeah, this example. So, uh, oh, and this is non Gorenstein part of, isn't it? And uh, uh, I'm just wondering that why uh, you find <laughs> uh, you pay attention to this kind of part of as they are saying. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the reason is just because I want to, con to construct. Uh, a non-reduced point on some K-moduli space. Uh -huh. 
So we wanted to, to construct, uh, because the previous example here tells you that the local structure of the stack and also the space is given by this. And it has, I mean, it is not uh, irreducible. It has different reducible components, but it is reduced. And this example tells you that here, I have some, something which is not reduced. And for threefolds, uh, Gorenstein toric Fano threefold, it is impossible to find such things. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, here, but the problem here is that uh, uh, th this uh, this facet is a tight one. So the, here the Gorenstein singularity is one. So, mm -hmm. Sorry, the Gorenstein index is one. So this singularity mm -hmm. here is Gorenstein. The problem mm -hmm. are given by these two facets, the actually four, these triangular ones. These are isolated terminal singularities of qu quotient terminal singularities of dimension uh, three. They are isolated and rigid, uh, so somehow they don't create any problem for the mm. deformation point of view. Oh, okay. I see. Thanks. You're welcome. Are there any more questions for Andrea? If not, let's thank, thank Andrea again. And we start again in 